Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this week we'll be discussing uh, Jodo Shinshu, um, and in, in other, it's otherwise known as Shin Buddhism in the West very often. Um, and this follows up my conversation uh, last month about Jodo Shu Buddhism as part of the whole series on East Asian Buddhism. <clears throat> Can you click on the screen? That's it. Uh, much like Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu is also a Pure Land school, Jodo. Again, as we have covered in previous discussions, Pure Land teachings and practices have been a whole subset of Mahayana doctrine from its inception. And, and as it was practiced and the teachings spread through East Asia and finally into Japan, uh, the Pure Land teachings had never been a distinct school. And this all changed with Honen, as he focused all of the attention upon a Nembutsu practice alone. So as a reminder, the, the turn of the 12th and 13th century with the advent of the Kamakura period, it was a turbulent time. There was social, uh, cultural, uh, certainly political shifts happening. And these shifts are reflected in the establishment of these new schools of Japanese Buddhism. Now, they are not certainly new to us. Uh, they're already hundreds of years old. Um, but it was certainly new to the Japanese of time. These schools, Jodoshu, Jodoshinshu, uh, Soto and Rinzai Zen, and Nichiren, are all called the new schools of Buddhism because they broke from the establishment of Tendai and Shingon primarily. Thus, there was a huge amount of religious change during this period. And Honen's development of the Jodoshu's thought and practice demonstrates that evolution. However, Shinran, the founder of Jodo Shinshu, takes those developments much further. Jodo Shinshu, in many ways, is very similar to Jodo Shu, but as a way to introduce some of the important distinctions between the two, let's discuss Shinran. He was of an aristocratic family, uh, part of uh, the northern Fujiwara clan, and was sent to Mount Hiei at the, mount, uh, at the age of eight. He spent nearly uh, 20 years on the mountain studying and training. However, over time, he had become disillusioned, realizing that even through his dedicated study and practice, he saw himself with defilements that could not be overcome. He felt, early even in his life, that everyone, including monks, nuns, would be destined to break the precepts, live immorally, and therefore not attain awakening. He left Enrakuji in his late 20s, descended the mountain, and took residence at Rokakudo, a temple uh, in Kyoto, uh, to complete a 100-day retreat there. And as the story goes, on his 95th day, um, of intense practice, he has a vision of Kanon Bosatsu, of Avokishibara, Bodhisattva. And, uh, but the vi image comes to him as, in this, uh, 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 looks like Prince Shotoku. And he was told to go and seek Honen, uh, and in him Shinran would find the path to salvation. And thus, at the completion of his retreat, that's exactly what he does. He immediately goes out and finds Honen, who at this point, point is in a different part of Kyoto, but had already descended the mountains himself, um, starting to really focus on just Jodoshu uh, Jodo teachings, so was already um, <laughs> outside of the Tendai establishment and, and, and already preaching in and around Kyoto. So, thus, at the, the completion uh, of his retreat, he goes and he talks to um, Honen, Shinran asked 100 days of questions to try to make sure that this path to salvation, this Nembutsu practice, was what was going to deliver dukkha ridden humans to some sort of salvation. And, as you might imagine, he was convinced. From that point on, Shinran always considered himself a disciple of Honen, even after their mutual banishments to opposing corners of Japan. 
And so for the next six years, from 1201 to 1207, until that banishment actually occurred, Shinran studied under Honen. And while in Kyoto, Shinran, like Honen, would have been spreading the word of the powerful influence of the Nenbutsu practice. Again, these guys were real rabble-rousers. They, they were getting, you know, like not a great amount, like not, a, not great attention paid to them by the establishment. So they weren't necessarily respected, but admired by, not respected by the establishment, but, but admired by everyone else. Again, uh, so these were, uh, with these proselytizations, they were exiled. Shinran was sent to Ichigo. Ichigo is a province uh, on the western coast far north of Kyoto. And this was obviously a huge transformational period for Shinran. He would come to title himself neither monk nor layman. Yet he did, uh, he did continue to preach, and his uncompromising focus was already more on faith and doctrine rather than the practice of mantra recitation. And so the way his teachings were expressed over this time during exile and how it was received by those new followers, it did suggest enough of a divergence from Honen's original message that over time, his students uh, merited his teachings as Jodo Shinshu, as distinct from Jodo Shu. Shinran had come to put complete faith in Amida Buddha. He exercised and extolled that faith. By the virtue of Amida's great vow, all beings would be benefited by Amida's endless compassion in their realm, Sukhavati. Honen had latched onto this idea, emphasizing the use of practice and contemplation of Nembutsu as a way to be reborn after death in Sukhavati. In that way, Honen and Joroshu is saying, do this thing and you get X reward. And it's somewhat mechanistic. Amida Buddha's great vow thus becomes a soteriological promise. Bliss after death. Uh, the, the land of bliss. Sukhavati is the land of bliss. Salvation. Remember, in our discussions about various Buddha's pure lands, the Buddha Kshetra, while they were still bodhisattvas, not fully awakened, they, each figure made great vows about their awakening, that as Buddhas, they would benefit all sentient beings in various <coughs> ways. It is in the making of these vows and the Buddha of Bodhisattva's subsequent full unexcelled awakening, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Buddhahood, that their pure land would then come into existence, fulfilling the promise of the vow. So, just as Amida Buddhas did in Sukhavati, and as it's described in the large Sukhavati Vuya Sutra, or the large Amida Buddha Sutra, those vows embed an innate quality of Sukhavati within itself of a promise of benevolence. And this is exactly what Honen and Shinran felt people needed. All people, regardless of class, wealth, or status. A way to access the promise of benevolence. Especially concerning, uh, con considering the tumultuous times of the Kamakura period, discussed previously. Tumultuous, yes, but also sully. Remember, these two were not only responding to current affairs, but also on a much grander scale. The age of the degenerate dharma, Mapo. This came to play an important role in Shinran's explanations. As we'll see in a second, Shinran seems to take, uh, take all that Honen was throwing and just keeps running with it. Because Shinran says that we can't help but be 
defiled, uh, sullied, uh, hindered, encumbered, uh, desirous by dukkha. I might say that we we can't help but not be not pure. We can't help but be not pure. I like not pure because it sounds better than oh you're gross, like you're defiling. <laughs> But, maybe more concisely, of course we can't judiciously follow the precepts. Of course not. During this age of Mapo, humans are incapable of self-awakening. As I mentioned before, uh, this is not too far from Honen's assertions, but Shinran is distinct in a couple ways. Uh, here, number one, the notion of what's called akunin shoki. And, and some various translations describe it as immoral people have the right capacity. Evil persons are the object of salvation. Or the evildoer is the principal object of Amida's compassion. And number two, the, the doctrine of tariki nembutsu. This other power, tariki, other power, a, a reliance upon salvation from outside influences, namely Amida Buddha, and the absence of power on the part of those caught in samsara. That, that's us. We can't help but be evil. Evil. Uh, don't be. Don't be caught up in the translation of evil. Uh, don't Westernize it or Jado Christianize it, uh, because according to Shinran's perspective, we all are. Being during Mapo means that we cannot be noble, you know, noble sons and daughters, right, or good. So we are all evil regardless of how you are in this life. There are huge philosophical leaps in these two very nuanced distinctions. And first, Akunin Shoki, it, it may be argued that Honen may have taught this, uh, at least orally, but Shinran and his disciples put a large emphasis on this teaching. According to Shinran, we are born and will die with passions and desires, which cannot be overcome through practice or any other human effort. Therefore, Shinran did not put much emphasis upon keeping the precepts <clears throat> or even a set of practices, for it would be pointless to set conditions as requirements to awakening during Mapo. His conviction of faith was placed in the idea that Amida alone allowed for humans just as they are, tainted, defiled, to achieve Buddhahood. Thus being reborn after death in the Pure Land based on their faith alone. One way in which we, he demonstrated this level of faith without fear of karmic retribution was by openly marrying as a monk several times and having children, and several of them. He also ate meat with his robes on. Now there's a distinction of at this time there may have been several priests who did eat meat, but they would do things like remove the remove the ro robes to make it okay that they ate meat, you know. But there are other examples of it. No, he would wear his robes while he ate, ate, ate meat. Because really, what he's trying to say was, here we are in samsara, veiled by one of the three marks of existence, dukkha, pain, suffering, desires. So Amida's great vow is directly targeting us for that reason. Because of course we are incapable of following the precepts. During this period, we are all immoral and thus have the right capacity 
We are the objects of salvation. And as for Tariki Nembutsu, this again can be seen in Joroshu's doctrine as reliance upon the other, but Joroshu still held on to more of the historical roots of the practice of Nembutsu. To Honen, you still had to do it. For Shinran, there cannot be a good practice if they are all unable to get you there, to get you for awakening. He would consider Nembutsu as a non-practice because it becomes more of an expression of unfailing gratitude and faith than a means to an end. So Shinran's Nembutsu gives a whole new meaning to Tariki. It is a complete letting go, of letting go of the reins, to into trust in Amida Buddha. Shinran talked about Shinjitsu no shin, uh, Shinjin, a, a, a true or pure faith in Amida's vow. He felt that Amida Buddha gave, gave faith to people when they had, even for a moment, opened themselves to Amida's unfailing benevolence. So again, emphasizing that the use of the Nimbutsu therefore is a sign of gratitude. This was a hugely effective and in influencing even more people into the fold of Pure Land practice. Because now, not only does it benefit all people up and down the social strata, but you didn't have to do anything? <laughs> Any practice? Just faith. However, before you go down the rabbit hole of, of bringing nihilism <laughs> into the conversation, Shinran, Shinran was very clear that he felt that once that faith was bestowed upon you, you had an obligation to show that gratitude in how you lived. Being a good person, being a functional, beneficial part of society. I'm, I'm going to quote uh, a popular Jodo Shinshu text, the Tainishi Sho, a collection of Shinran's sayings that his disciple Uien uh, assembled in the latter half of the 13th century. There's one passage, uh, chapter 3, which I've seen many times in different places uh, during my research uh, for the, the talk tonight, and I was struck with this one in particular because it really encapsulates these two distinctions. I mean, bear with me, it's a, it's a little long, so I split it up a little bit. And it's on your handout. Even the good person can attain rebirth. How much more so the evil person? Now, people usually say the opposite. Even the evil person can attain rebirth. How much more so the good person? On the face of it, this seems reasonable. Yet it is contrary to the spirit of the original vow of the other power, that is Tariki. The, research, the reason is that those good people who accumulate merit through self-effort, Jiriki, are not in accord with the original vow, as long as they lack the attitude of total dependence on the other power. But if they turn from self-power, Jiki, and earnestly rely on the other power, Tariki, they will be reborn in the land of true recompense, that is Amida's pure land, Sukhavati. Since it was to save evil people, unable by any practice whatsoever to find release from the cycle of birth and death, that Amida made his vow. We can say that evil, uh, evil person who, that evil person who comes to rely on the vow is the principal object of Amida's compassion. Thus, 
it is properly said, even the good person can attain rebirth. How much more so the evil person? The, the statement ties these two characteristics of Shinran's teachings into an argument that could certainly be convincing to a lot of people. I think we can all relate, and if we ask anyone, uh, I can assume that, do you really feel that you're a pure person? <laughs> you know, truly, completely pure. So we need faith in other. Salvation from something else. And what's more is that it is the dukkha that we go through it's the stuff that encumbers us and makes us evil. We, we have to experience that dukkha to know and experience the faith in Amida. If you have no suffering, if you're good and noble, why would you rely on Tariki, on the other? And that reliance on Jiriki, the, the mechanistic self-power, breeds egoism, selfishness. So the logic goes that, of course, the evil person would benefit more from Amida Buddha's aid. We are all the more likely because we have the right capacity to need salvation. Now, I may personally want to poke holes in all of this. I really want to justify practice, okay? But this argument has proven to be effective and long-lasting. Jodo Shinshu has continued and has amassed the most followers and is the largest Japanese Buddhist denomination in Japan today. It has been incredibly effective. However, for many, and maybe more so in the West, faith is hard. <laughs> Pure faith is hard. In the same way that even just generally asking for help for most of us from another person, it's hard. It takes trust letting your guard down, to be a little vulnerable, humble. It's hard to ask for help. We have to admit shortcomings. Do we really believe that we'll actually get help? Where's that immediate relief? I mean, Life, you know, this bliss after death, I mean, that's a delayed gratification. That, 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 that's a delayed reward that most people don't have the attention span for. No, I don't have the attention span for it. it. We have a hard time with that. We can ask for help. We can trust. And I'll end it there. I mean... <laughs> Uh, may, maybe, maybe a question mark. Trust? <laughs> thank, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm sure there are comments, uh, but uh, I don't know if Ichishima Sensei is on um, or not, but I would open it up to him uh, and Monshin Sensei first if, if there was anything in particular that you wanted to. I don't see Ichishima Sensei. Ichishima Sensei, okay. Monshin Sensei. Um, I would just make uh, two comments, and one is that keep in mind that um, one of the big presum presumptions of both the Pure Land and the, which is Jodoshu, and the new Pure Land, or the true Pure Land, Jodoshinshu, is Mapo, which you mentioned. But to go back to that, that is one of the major, that's one of the major premises of this entire, entire enterprise. And the other comment that I would make is that when you were mentioning that um, Honen really still relied on practice, the practice was Nembutsu, and some people may not know what that is. And Nembutsu is just the recitation of Namo Mita Butsu, Namo Mita Butsu. 
And according to Honan's doctrine, if one said it with true sincerity six times, that's what it took to gain admission to the pure land. This was actually based on the Tendai doctrine presented by Genshin, which was the Ojo Yoshu, which was part of the deathbed Nembutsu practice. And so that was one of the things that set those two schools apart. I mean, they were still very similar in terms of their total philosophy, but set them apart. One was still relying upon at least the modicum of practice, and the other was saying practice isn't going to do anything because MAPO is so pervasive. What is MAPO? MAPO is the period of the degenerate Dharma. There were three periods of the Dharma, the period of the pure Dharma or the real Dharma, and that's when Shakyamuni Buddha taught and his disciples were still teaching. And then the period of mimicry that occurred after that, and that's when people could teach the Dharma, but it didn't have the same efficacy as the true Dharma. And then the third period is they were so far away from Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings that it was no longer, that one could not attain awakening on one's own merit. And that was something, and I refer you to Jan Nantier's work on that. She did a really superb work, which that idea actually came out of Hinduism, into Buddhism. But the way that it was originally told was that in the future, once all of the Buddha's teachings had no longer been relevant, then Maitreya, the future Buddha of the future, would appear to reteach or to be the new Buddha of the new age. And so just keep in mind that those two schools really held on to that, and that required the idea of Tariki, and the opposition of that would be the Zen schools, which are exactly the opposite, in which one can only do it through one's own power. So in that sense, the Zen schools sort of totally ignored the idea of Mapo. The Pure Land schools adopted the idea of Mapo and made that a central feature of their teaching. Tendai was actually saying, yes, it's harder now, but it's not impossible. It just means you have to practice harder than you did before. Which, you know, you think about it, and that makes some sort of sense. You know, the founder of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, he was so able to convey the teachings that it would have been easier to understand it. And that mere mortals like myself or other monks are recapitulating what he had said, but we're not as effective at saying it as he was. It makes perfect sense, and over time, the teaching certainly changed. So there is an internal logic to it, but that's what Mapo is. And so I think that that is really an important aspect to this. And also keep in mind, as Koshin was saying, that there was a lot of turmoil during that Common Core period. That's when the shogunate moved into Common Core, and that caused an enormous number of battles with the daimyo, the wealthy landowners and people like that. And so people were really looking for answers in a very difficult time. Zen was offering an answer to the samurai, and Jodo Shinshu was offering answers to the common people. And so that's one way of characterizing those two different things. The samurai, think of the samurai as privileged guys, right? They control their own destiny. The average person did not control their own destiny. They really relied upon the daimyo, the shogunate, and others. So they were already in reliance upon others. So the idea of relying upon Amida Buddha was, I think, much more easy for the people at that time. So thank you. Thank you.